All right, hello, good evening. Hi. I wanted to thank Jay for giving me this opportunity to talk to you, but he gave me a, a difficult topic and it uh, could, could spend a lot of time. I'll try and not do too much. But I thought a, a good place to begin would be with some definitions. We're interested, whoops, in twilight. Twilight occurs when the sun is below the horizon but it is, light is reflected off the upper atmosphere and scattered, and that scattered light then reflects and illuminates the lower atmosphere. So we're interested in that time because of the colors uh, that are, can be produced during twilight. Astronomers break twilight down into three phases, uh, depending on the angle of the sun. So when the sun is zero to six degrees below the horizon, we're in civil twilight, six to 12 degrees below nautical twilight, and 12 to 18 astronomical twilight. In terms of what it looks like, civil twilight is that time when it's still light enough to do things outside without a flashlight, roughly. Great time for playing tag or croquet or whatever. Um, nautical twilight is when there's still, uh, you can still see enough stars in the sky to navigate by them, especially if you were a mariner, hence the name nautical twilight. And ast astronomical twilight is really dark. You might think it was night, but there's still enough light in the sky that it obscures the stars just enough that it's not good for astronomical observations or for photography. So if you're gonna do night sky photography, you wanna avoid shooting uh, too early. You wanna get out when it's really <laughs> night. So I have a, an app on my phone called Photo Pills. It has a variety of things, but it gives these times for these various events uh, for Monday this week for Iowa City. So if we got up early in the night, 341, astronomical twilight lasts uh, about an hour. Astronomical dawn then uh, occurs and astronomical twilight gives way to nautical twilight, lasts enough 45 minutes or so, and then that gives way to civil twilight. Uh, now, you'll notice that I've broke, actually civil twilight is this blue hour plus the golden hour before sunrise. But I'm gonna, since we're photographers, I'm gonna to refer to the blue light portion of civil twilight. You'll notice that the blue hour only lasts about 13 minutes uh, yesterday in Iowa City. Uh, followed by some very nice golden light for another 45 minutes and then sunrise. Followed by some more beautiful light for another 45 minutes or so. Daylight. And then the whole sequence just repeats itself, but in reverse. It's a palindrome. If you flip that top part down on a hinge, right, the whole thing would just repeat. You would go golden hour to sunset, more golden hour, blue light, and so on. So the big difference between sunrise and sunset is that the sequence of the order of things, the light, is reversed. I have read that there are, on average, some small differences in the quality of light that sunset, you might get more dust and dirt picked up, giving you more color. Sunrise might be a stiller, calmer time of day. But those are average differences and they're small. In, in my experience, those differences are overshadowed by other effects, principally uh, your latitude, elevation, climate, whether you're, you're an arid or a, a damp environment, and weather, of course, is the most obvious one. Uh, high pressure, low pressure, whether they're in the west or the, in the east. Uh, where the clouds are, are there clouds? All those things are much more important in affecting the quality of light than any small average differences between sunrise and sunset. The last thing I wanna say about this is not so much about this time, which is when I'm gonna, I wanna talk about. I'm, I'm not just talking about the moment of sunrise and the moment of sunset. I'm talking about the, the time around that when there's likely to be color in the sky. But it's also, as I mentioned before, relevant that if you're gonna photograph the night sky, you wanna be out late. And also, if you're photographing sunset or sunrise, well, sunset, you wanna stay out well after sunset. There's a lot that happens afterwards. And likewise, if you're going out to photograph sunrise, get in place at least a half hour before the sunrise because there's a lot of interesting stuff that can go on well before sunrise. Okay, that's, 
that one. There we go. All right, so the first uh, slide I wanted to share with you, the first picture is taken, was taken at uh, Great Sand Dunes National Park. This is Medno Creek in the foreground and the uh, Sangre de Cristo Mountains in the, in the background. You're looking directly east. The sun has not quite risen. It's just behind the mountains, but you're, it's still very bright in the sky. And one of the reasons I wanted to share this slide, I think it's a good demonstration of the major problem that we all face as photographers in this environment, and that is that the sky is so much brighter than the foreground. The dynamic range is huge, and that is accentuated because I'm facing the sun. Right? I'm, I'm making that, in this photo, has a huge dynamic range, uh, probably beyond the capacity of your sensors to capture all at once. So one thing I'd like to do tonight is uh, present a, uh, at least three different tools of how you deal with that problem. I think it's wise to have not just a single approach, but to have a toolbox. So you can pick this tool or that tool or the other technical approach, because not every sunrise and sunset is alike, and, and you might want to handle them differently. Uh, so the way I handled this one was, or the way I dealt with this one was with graduated neutral density filters, or GNDs. Um, so to start with, there's a filter holder that the threads of which screw into the threads for the filter on the front of your lens. And then this uh, rectangular boxy thing here is the filter holder. And then plastic or glass filter slides down into the filter holder. Uh, you'll note that it is dark at the top and clear at the bottom. The dark part is neutral, which means that it doesn't affect the color, only the amount of light that gets through. So the general idea is to pull this filter down so that the dark part of the filter covers the bright part of the sky, leaving the foreground or dark part of your scene to not be covered by anything else to, so you get the full amount of light from that. As you're evening out, the amount of light that gets to your camera from the bright and the, and the dark parts of the scene. Oh, Jay, if you have questions at any time, I think it's easier if you pipe up now and ask them now when they're on your mind uh, rather than wait to the end. So I'm happy to receive, you know, interrupt me um, if, you, if you want to ask a question or talk more about something. But the GNDs uh, come in different densities. So two stop filter on the left and a four stop filter on the right. They come in two, three, and four stops. The one on the left is also a soft edge so that the transition from the full effect of the filter to no effect is smooth and covers a good deal of the, of the filter. And they also come in a hard edge where that transition is very narrow and you get a, a quick transition. So I carry six filters, a two, three, four soft, and a two, three, four hard. Uh, you don't, I mostly use the three, two and three soft, but the others come in handy from time to time. So I thought this was a, a good candidate for the use of filters just because the border between the very bright sky and the rest of the photo was relatively flat. There were no sharp mountains or jagged valleys or trees crossing that boundary so that when I pull the uh, filter down, there wasn't an obvious uh, impact of, oh, there's some filter, there's it not. And in this one, I probably pulled the soft edge down as far as the sand in the, in the creek here so that the, uh, the dark part of the filter was covering the sky. And it's just because the scene was arranged that way that I felt it was a good candidate for uh, the use of a GND to solve this problem of big dynamic range. The next example is from uh, Bandon Beach in Oregon. Um, we're looking south. The Pacific Ocean is to your right. The sun is rising to your left. It's very different than the previous photo because you're not looking directly at the sun. And the dynamic range, the difference in brightness between the sky and the, and the foreground is not as great as it was in the previous slide, in the previous picture. If I were taking this picture today rather than the two or three years, two years ago that 
I actually took it, I would not use a GND at all. In fact, I took some time trying to remember if I did use one, and I probably did. Uh, but today, because even two years ago, but certainly five years ago, I, I would have needed a GND. But cameras have gotten so much better. Sensors have gotten so much better. Software has gotten so much better. You don't need GNDs as much as you did certainly five years ago. You can recover a lot of the highlights and open up a lot of the shadows just with your regular capture, especially when you're not shooting into the sun, when you're capturing the color at an angle from the sun, as in this photo. I have to now, the next slide is an embarrassment. This is the raw capture. It's grossly underexposed. It's a terrible exposure. Um, also have dirty sensor here and here. Um, one of the things I do is I, I wander away from a group uh, to explore just because you know, you're in an environment where there's good light and interesting things, but you don't know where the clouds are going to be, where the color is changes. You've got to be always alert because even though it was over here a few minutes ago, it might be over here next. You've got to be looking around, moving around. And the, the rest of the group, I was with Mark Rasmussen at the time, was down here. You can see one of the people here, maybe. And I wandered away looking up the beach. And then I turned around and met with this scene, the reflection and the sky. It seemed like the color filled up the whole sky. And I was just really moved by it. But what do you do now? Well, this is one of the ones where you can pretty much rely on, in, my, in this case, Lightroom is, is my major editor, but whatever you use to pull out some of the detail that I missed because of the terrible exposure. So I brought up the, I got to get over here, read it myself, but brought up the exposure a lot, shadows a lot, uh, whites a lot, and I moved the blacks back down. The first three ex um, changes, the exposure, high, uh, shadows and, and whites, are all moving the histogram, widening it and moving it to the right. But I felt that it moved it too far, and I needed to move the tail of the histogram back down to ground the image in the blacks. I feel it's very important to, to ground the blacks so you get true blacks, not only for the, the blacks themselves, but as you move that black slider down and make sure you use this whole histogram, it affects the color in the sky, deepening and brightening that color if you have true blacks at the lower end of your histogram. So I did that. Then, I, in addition to clarity, I did these several adjustments, uh, improved the, recover some of the color that was in the picture that I, that I ruined with my terrible capture. So brought up dehaze, vibrance, and a little saturation. But I also went to the hue, saturation, luminance panel, and specifically increased the saturation for red and magenta to bring up the color in the clouds. I think, yeah? I have once or twice, but um, only for very creative photos. Not, you know, I, I'm not into changing the, the colors in that way. I, I, I haven't done it much. But it, I, where I, the one or twice I have used it, it's amazing what it can do. You can change red to blue, for instance. And, uh, but not certainly not in a landscape or picture like this. So I was pretty pleased with these adjustments, and. Uh, impressed that you could do so much from that terrible original capture to recover all this uh, dynamic range and color in that photo. But as I was looking at it, I realized, wait a minute, this foreground, the reflections are brighter than the sky. Now, that, that's not right. Ordinarily, the foreground is darker. and You want to uh, darken the sky or lighten the foreground, but what I think happened was, I think I pulled a, a GND over this scene, you know, and I probably darkened the sky too much. So what do you do? Well, Lightroom gives you a wonderful tool to just do the opposite. So it's this um, graduated filter tool, and it works very much like the GND that I showed you in the uh, previous picture. So I set the adjustments for it to increase the contrast a lot, 
further contrast adjustment by bumping up whites, lowering blacks, and I increase the saturation, which in addition to saturating the colors, has the effect of darkening them. And then I pulled that uh, filter from this point up to here, and that has the effect of applying all those adjustments at full force below the line, and not at all above the line, with the space between the lines being the transition between darkening and leaving alone. It's working a lot like that GND, only I've turned it upside down in this example. Ordinarily, you would, if you want to darken the sky, for instance, you would start here and pull it down to apply the effect uh, before where you started and leave it alone below. Is that plain enough? Have I made it clear? So the result, if we flip back and forth from this one, notice this, this area here, the change in brightness and color. That's, that's all I've done is make it from brighter than the sky to a little bit darker than the sky. Okay, and that's the chief impact of that. And overall, I was very pleased with those adjustments. Once again, I said uh, I was careless, not only with the exposure, but apparently also with the sensor spots so I cleaned up a lot of those using this spot editor tool up here. Everywhere there's a spot, you click on it to go away. And then here's the, the final uh, picture. Now, I wanted to say, when I saw this picture, I was thrilled. I was, you know, you're, you're out there, the Pacific Ocean is on your right hand, the birds are in the air, the sound of the waves, you know, the smell of the salt air and that just the wonder of the color opening up as the morning progressed. To me, it was like being in a flower as it was blooming, and there you are, and you're right in the middle of it, and there's all this bloom, all this color around you, and I was filled with that. And I realized as I was doing this presentation, I, I went back and re-edited the photos to make sure I knew what I had done to them. And I realized that when I'm pushing those sliders around, I'm not only trying to recreate the colors in the scene as I remember it, I'm trying to recreate the emotional content, what I felt when I took it. You know, I try to get it so that it, it's, it, you feel the expanse of it and the, the beauty of the colors and all of that. And I feel that that's uh, an important uh, reason, to uh, guideline to use to, to help you in your adjustments. And, not to be shy about trying to evoke those emotions in the picture that you felt when you take them. Uh, a, a really good picture will convey some of that, um, that emotion. I don't know whether this one does for you or not, but I, I really, it was, it was a wonderful day to be alive, a wonderful moment to be out there. Okay, that's example two. So we have a GND. One, two is rely on your editing thing to pull out highlights and details especially when you're not shooting directly into the, into the sun. The third example is a sunset, a little bit maybe unusual example, but this is the Organ Pipe National Monument three years ago. Um, and it was well after sunset, so the sun is below the horizon. We're clearly in, in deep into twilight time. And the, what color there was in the sky and what clouds there were were to the west. So you're shooting into the, toward the sun again. And mostly what you saw was a bunch of saguaro cactus sticking up in silhouette, right, with this bright sky behind it. And that was fun for a while, but I saw this choya cactus and I thought, wow, look at the way it's backlit and what the backlighting does to the spines on the cactus. And I thought, wouldn't this be fun to try and photograph? Now, I think this is a poor candidate for a GND because the cactus sticks up into the sky, and you've got a very jagged, irregular line between the bright sky and the dark cactus. And if you pull the filter down over that, either as a GND or in Lightroom using their graduated filter tool, you're going to darken the top half of the cactus. So you have this weird dark top of the cactus and light bottom, and that wouldn't work. At least not in my hands, it, it wouldn't. Maybe someone else could do it. So what I decided on was HDR. Maybe this is a good candidate for a high dynamic range. So I set up and I took actually eight photos, one step apart, 
I ended up throwing out the least exposed and the most. So uh, this one here, this is one of six images that I find finally used where this one is the most underexposed and the one on the right is the most exposed. This was four seconds, yeah, four seconds and two, one half quarter and then one eighth second. Um, I, I have the other XF data if you want it. But then you select all of those in Lightroom, I, I use, you can do it in Photoshop, of course, but photo merge, merge to HDR, and out pops this. And you think, why did you bother? <laughs> this is terrible. Well, the chief reason you do it is if you were to take any one of the six original photos and edit it in Lightroom, okay? Now grab a hold of the exposure slider and move it all the way to the left it goes to minus five. All the way to the right, it goes to plus five. You've got 10 stops of dynamic range available to you if you edit any of the original photos. If you do the same thing with the HDR in Lightroom, pull it all the way to the left, it goes minus 10. All the way to the right, it goes plus 10. You've got 20 stops of dynamic range to play with. And that additional information also applies to all the other sliders in, in that basic panel. So you've got a whole lot more latitude with this. So you do take this into the uh, editor in Lightroom, and it's this exact file now, the HDR, and whammo, all you've done here is pull the highlights all the way down, minus 100, all the way down, and that recovers all the color that was seen in the least exposed of the original six. And then you bring up the shadows and the blacks and you open up the shadows in the ground and in the cactus that were evident in the most exposed end of the series of original photos. Um, I also added some clarity, dehaze and vibrance to bring back some of the colors. I used a tone curve panel to play a little bit with the contrast in the mid-range, brought down the lights, brought up the darks. And in the HSL hue saturation luminance, I played not with the saturation this time, but with luminance. And mostly the big effect here was to bring down the blues to darken the sky and increase the color contrast between the blue sky and the red in the clouds. This green adjustment had very little effect on in the cactus itself. And then after some spot cleanup, here's the final image. And once again, it's the, it's the feeling of being there that I was, was driving me as I was trying to create this image, as well as to recall what it looked like. And it's the, it's the extremes, the contrast that uh, impressed me in this photo, the, the sharpness of the cactus spines against the smoothness of the sky, the, the range of colors and the range of light from the light sky to the cactus, it's still dark. And so it's, it's that feeling of being there in this land of extremes that was the emotional drive to the editing uh, overlaying across the efforts to recreate the scene. Okay, so that's, that's the HDR approach. We're all good so far? All right. Uh, this one is Castle Mountain in Banff National Park, the Bow River. Um, once again, I was traveling with Mark Rasmussen, uh, and we had been to this location the two previous days. Were you there, Mary? No? Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, and we, we didn't get, the two previous days, we didn't get any color in the sky. We went back this third day, and the color that was in the sky was behind this scene back across the other side of the road. And that's where everybody was, where I started out, but I wasn't getting anything that I liked. So I went back over here and so did Chris Sprick. You know Chris, she went up this little creek a ways over here. Um, but I got out here and I saw that there was some color in the sky and that it bracketed, it framed Castle Mountain. Now, it was about 150 degrees apart. So this is, if this is west, then this is east, northeast. You, you know, it's, it's, it's way far apart. So this 
much more than you could capture in a single frame. So I set up my tripod and took six photos in um, portrait orientation overlapping by about 20%. Highlight them all, go to photo merge, but this time panorama instead of HDR, it stitches it. And from that point, then it's the same kind of adjustments that I've shown you before. Things where we're gonna bring up the, the color a little bit in the clouds to highlight that bracketing. But uh, one of the things that I, I wanted to say about this photo was that I, I often not using sunset as the principal subject. You often think, are you taking a picture of that red ball going down? Well, okay, that's fun. But other times I'm using the, the this color in the sky as kind of a supporting part of the supporting cast. Here, this color is framing and bracketing the mountain as are the trees on either side. The reflection, a little bit of reflection in the water adds to that effect. And it's it's that use of uh, sunset that I like the most, where it's not the principle, where you're not just a picture of the colors, but you're using the colors to as part of the composition, right? As a compositional element um, in creating the photo. And another example of that, my final image is from White Pocket. Yeah. Do you process uh, these six images to light before you merge them, or do you merge and then process? I've done it both ways. Um, so yeah, and it, I think the answer is that if uh, if one end of the, the um, picture, say on the right this side, is a whole lot brighter than the other side, then the separate processing doesn't work as well. So then I've, I've, I've had more success to stitch the panorama first and then edit the whole thing later. Whereas if I were shooting more uh, a scene that was more uniformly lit left to right, I might very well get a better result by processing. Um, Castle Mountain, I probably um, processed first, <coughs> stitched later, I think probably would be the more way to go about that. But the other thing I want to say about the, another panorama, so it's, a, it's, a, it's this breadth of color that I wanted to capture, but another version of that using color as a supporting character. Here, it's the color of the light reflected off the rock that adds to and enhances the, color, the beautiful colors of the rock that are there. But it's not just the sky, right? It, and it's not just the light as a supporting element, but it's the way it augments the color of the scene, particularly when that has interesting colors that complement the color of the light, as it does here at White Pocket. That's all I've got. If there's, uh, yeah, Marty. When you do, when you do the panorama and you process each individual one, do you, do you combine it? Yeah. Do you process them all identically, or how do you do that? That's what I, that yeah. I so. I try both ways. Sometimes it works better one way, sometimes the other. But when I do them separately, I'll pick like the average photo in terms of exposure, process it, and then sync. Sync all six so they all get processed the same. Then there might be some additional adjustments that you would do later. And if they were focused uh, adjustments in different parts of the photo, well, fine. That you might need to do that as well. Thank you, Mark. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.